This is the current state of the MCU. Oh my goodness! It already stinks! Some of you agreed with that. And some of you didn't. But regardless of your opinion, your attention is still on the MCU. And I think that we can all agree that its quality has been becoming more akin to diarrhea since the end of phase 3. And this discussion around whether or not everything is juggernaut known as the MCU produces is good or not creates a hyper focus on it that generates more attention from people who defend it, praise it, degrade it, and criticize it. You can especially see this online where the constant blabbering about Marvel shows and movie never ends. But this is all in Marvel Studios' interest. Even though people have seen the quality decreasing, it's getting more popular. You can look at Google Trends and see the MCU is still consistently getting more attention since late 2020. Disregarding these huge spikes because that's when Endgame and Infinity War came out. The Phase 4 movies haven't been received the best either. Out of the MCU's top 10 lowest rated content online, almost 50% of it is from Phase 4. Punch my mama in the throat, karate kick my daddy in the chest, what the fuck, oh my god. God. With everything else being a mix of phases 1 and 2, this is ridiculous. And it's a telltale sign that Marvel is failing creatively. But even so, Phase 4 has brought one of Marvel's most successful movies of all time, Spider-Man No Way Home. Even though it's mediocre writing-wise, and Spider-Man's one of my favorite heroes of all time. But those who are fine with what the MCU is putting out will continue consuming their stories, and some of them who aren't will too. Because of a concept known as hate-watching, continuing the cycle and generating Marvel more attention and revenue. Now the reason hate watching is such a powerful tool is because there is a pleasure in reading televisual text against the grain and inhabiting the role of anti-fandom. It's fun to watch while recognizing that it's not smart and there is something that reasserts your smartness. And I don't think there's a movie that is more indicative of the MCU's divisive mediocrity that has garnered as many hate watchers than Thor Love and Thunder. I'm going to be critiquing it and providing ideas that would have strengthened the narrative by the way. The movie starts with Gore and his daughter struggling across the desert. Then his daughter dies and he comes across the gods and realizes they never cared and becomes the emo edgelord incarnate killing them all the next scene we get some exposition from korg and then we finally get to focus on thor and after a goofy ass fight scene where he destroys a temple of the native people which is dumb because you would think the man who had his entire home destroyed and people displaced would understand the sensitivity stupidity and kind of evilness behind doing that but Thor isn't well written in his own story but whatever so then we get to see that Jane has cancer and she realizes Milnor might be able to alleviate her pain then we get a fucking Old Spice ad in the middle of the movie stop this madness what do you want from me ah, what do you want then the Guardians and Thor realize that Gore is going around killing gods. And this is where the infamous screaming goats were introduced. And to be honest, they didn't annoy me in the least. I, I didn't care that they screamed 48 times or whatever. <laughs> then Thor witnesses firsthand the power of Gore. You're missing an arm. I'm gonna get you home. And then Gore attacks New Asgard where this happens. Obviously, this makes no sense that the hammer can just piece itself back together. It could have done that any other movie after Ragnarok. And Jane being able to use it makes her entire involvement in this movie impossible and contrived. Anyway, fighting happens. And Gore steals everyone's children and the heroes conversate and decide to go after him. Damn, look at my fucking forehead! After some interesting scenes I'll talk about in depth later, our heroes take the LGBT bridge into Zeus's realm. And this is where the infamous scene takes place. And flicker. See, if I was there, I just would have. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. I had to get my wild video code in. So anyway, Thor does this. Okay, that's one of the ways to resolve conflict in a way that makes the pacing feel rushed. So they get away and while traveling to the Shadow Realm, the characters have conversations. Valkyrie's all like... And Korg is all like... Speaking of futures, I was forging one of my own with a dude I met called Dwayne. You know, they could have just had Korg say, I'm a penis! 
That would have been way more entertaining and still gets the point across. Dende arrived to the Shadow Realm, but it's a trap. Oh no, 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 oh no. And Gore brings up some very interesting ideas. And a fight ensues. But this fight is so weird because unlike the first one where Gore utilized his shadow hopping power more frequently, which proved to be more effective, in this one he only uses it once to style Valkyrie. Why didn't he constantly abuse it like he did last time? It has no drawbacks and is much more effective. You were fighting literal gods. You don't have time to be fighting them hand to hand, dude. The plot reduced Gore's basic intelligence in order to push the story in the direction it needed because realistically he should have killed Valkyrie and did much more damage to the characters in this conflict but whatever. They get away after Stormbreaker is taken and we get a little bit of info on Jane's condition. But something's affecting her body's ability to fight the cancer. I'm sorry, Thor. So then Valkyrie's all like. So Thor has to leave by himself to go fight Gore and he makes it to the kids where he proceeds to do this. The power of This is literally impossible, but this scene also has another interesting implication. Thor should have had to fight all these creatures by himself, which would have given Gore more time, and he might have gotten into the portal with no issues. But Jane comes back anyway. And and creates more problems in the plot. Gore gets his wish. Whatever daddy wants, daddy gets. This was the obvious wish to make the entire time, but the plot made Gore as intelligent as cum water in order to have Thor have this heroic influence moment. I know your pain, but this isn't the way. It's not death or revenge that you seek. What do I seek? You seek love. And it makes me want to go shower in lava so damn bad. So the girl comes back and has no reaction to her dad dying. <laughs> Okay, then Jane dies and Thor takes Gore's daughter as his own. There you go. Hey, breakfast. Excuse me. What is that? They're, they're pan flaps from Earth. I don't think I like pan flaps. This story exploded one of my biggest soft spots. Dad, adoptive daughter, character dynamics. I fucking love these dynamics so much. Then the movie ends and this happens. Do you understand me, Hercules? Do you understand me, my son? Yes, father. Why did Marvel think it was a good idea to introduce an antagonist that is ideologically inferior, motivationally less compelling, and extremely less powerful than a villain that was already killed? I mean, even Zeus was scared of Gore. I am scared. Gore has the necro sword, which means he could kill us. Gore should have been left for Thor's last solo movie since he is such a threatening, potential filled villain. Characters only have to be three things, compelling, believable, and purposeful. So Jane is immediately garbage because she literally turns into a great value Thor, which in itself is impossible. So most of what she contributes to the plot is null and void. Her having cancer and having to face her morality was not giving nearly enough respect and time because instead the writers were focusing on So I was thinking when we get to the bad guy, what about if I had like a cool catchphrase like Eat this hammer! Bang! Cancer is something real people go through and to give a disrespectful amount of attention and character exploration from this dilemma is terrible. All we get is a scene where she hits a sink and her sitting in a chair receiving chemo and her being in the hospital for a little bit. A perfect example of how facing morality changes a person is Breaking Bad. 
The entire plot happens just because Walter White has cancer. Now I'm not saying Jane had to have an extremely drastic negative change in her character, but cancer is inherently negative, so seeing a more negative side to Jane would have been realistic. But the nuance and time that was needed wasn't there since this movie is only two hours long. And because of the missed potential and irresponsible handling, it falls flat on its ass. Plus there are no consequences whatsoever to her death because she's literally sent to Valhalla. I see you're dead now. Uh, yeah and can live freely and happily. Plus, no one was even negatively affected by her death. Even she herself didn't even seem to be negatively affected by the fact she died. Like, bro, are you good? <laughs> This sacrifice was devoid of all emotional investment since the reason it happens is a plot hole. Get this bullshit out of here. Here are her stats. My boy Gore was such wasted potential, I want to throw up and roll around in it. First of all, he's cool as hell. He can summon these weird ass creatures and stuff, and he's a genuine threat. But one of the main consequences of him receiving this power isn't utilized well. It has the ability to slay gods, but it slowly corrupts and kills whoever wields it. Since he had a decaying mind, he should have been more erratic and unstable in his actions. But he isn't because Taika Waititi terrorized this character with wasted potential and mediocre writing. Like, dude, come on. So, I'm going to improve Gore. So at the beginning, he could have been like... And then to really portray the mental decay and the fact that he was filled with hatred and was truly despicable, he should have killed the children out of jealousy that the other parents had the opportunity to love their children while he did not, which was a really missed opportunity. The second fight where he just doesn't use his shadow hopping is just dumb. And of course, the children being alive while he's opening the gate is baffling. Like, you have no use for them. Get rid of them. And the sword getting destroyed is ridiculously bonkers. And in the first fight, instead of trying to injure or kill Thor in this vulnerable position, you know the powerful god that is a major threat to him? But instead, the plot has him make funny dialogue. Pain. What is pain? The construct invented by the weak. Oh, okay, the first time. <laughs> Also, the fact that his intelligence is belittled for Thor to be able to do this heroic good guy mind change at the last moment is ridiculous. So here are his stats. Korg is probably the most tragic character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Because once he got his body destroyed, I felt bad for him. Because I had to realize he had no dick, no balls. No like that made me so emotional. I'm li I'm literally tearing up right now. But besides that, he's as useful as watery tape and doesn't do anything. It's ironic because he's like a literal rock. Plus the bullshit where he dies but it only turns out his face is alive is a fucking bruh moment. Here's a list of everything that makes Thor less believable. He didn't get killed by Gore in the final battle when he should have because Jane shouldn't exist. To hammer jealousy and all of Thor's interactions with Jane. Thor is turned into a mega goofy ass superhero. And he really didn't learn to love again even though that's supposedly his entire arc in this movie. He kind of just kissed Jane and talked to her a bit, but there wasn't any active learning where we see Thor becoming more open to connection and going through the tedious and difficult task of breaking down mental barriers, especially considering everything he's been through. He's just like, Jane? And it's more reminiscent of having a high school crush. <laughs> it's a little uh, hot in than suppressing or working through trauma in order to have a genuine romantic connection again. You got a girlfriend? Oh, no, no. <laughs> Too busy, don't have time, you know. The work and everything. Huh? Cool. I mean, even when she dies, he's kind of like, okay, bye, whatever. <music> Extending the movie's length and having him go through this journey to fill again with more time could have helped. And having him actually build a more multifaceted relationship with good and bad aspects, even if it was kind of shallow, would have made everything hold up better. Now, let me show you Thor's best moment in this movie. <laughs> oh.
Themes are delicate balancing acts in stories. Now, the legitimacy of higher powers is a theme I legit love because it's extremely interesting, but the existence of Thor's team trying to save the children disproves this absolutely corrupted mindset Gore has. But it's not that simple. Gore is still correct to look at the gods as corrupt pieces of shit, and just because some of them disproved his mindset doesn't all of a sudden make his entire philosophy trash or even incorrect. It just makes things a tad bit more complicated. Now, love is interesting because I feel like in this movie, they could have easily tied the theme of love into Thor trying to reunite with his broken hammer. Instead of trying to make it quirky, oh, I'm jealous, funny moments, it should have been used to portray him trying to reconnect with a time where he wasn't as broken and was happier. Because when he had his hammer, everything wasn't as bad in his life. It was only after he lost his weapon that his life hit a steady decline. And I believe part of the inherent appeal of love is that it adds more peace and happiness to your life. And particularly because of Gord's existence, love should have been explored with less Hollywood romanticization and more grittiness. But then again, I wouldn't expect soulless Hollywood donkeys to understand what love is. Gore being the shell of who he used to be and going through this type of trauma because of his love for his dead daughter would have made great opportunities to explore the consequences of of loving people. But since love is used immaturely and more idealistically than it should have, considering the weight of everything else in this movie, it falls flat on its ass. You're talking about love here, the thing that breaks people's motivations to live, drives people to kill, and makes them happier than they can ever imagine. That in itself begets a respect that just isn't present here. Oh yeah, that's bow, go to dumplings. Psst, hey bow. <laughs> I love Bao. He honestly saves this inoffensively mediocre movie. Everyone say bye, Bao. Oh.